This video provides an introduction to structural equation modeling, or SEM. SEM refers to a family of procedures that is primarily used to test theoretical models involving proposed causal associations among a set of variables. In this regard, SEM can be thought of largely as a confirmatory approach to analyzing structural associations among variables. Even so, SEM is flexible enough to incorporate exploratory analyses of data. SEM assumes that proposed relations among variables can be represented in a, in a set of structural regression equations and that these re relations in turn can be represented pictorially. There are particular drawing conventions that are utilized in the representation of theoretical models and we'll talk about that shortly. Other terms for SEM include covariance structure analysis, covariance structure modeling, analysis of covariance structures, and also causal modeling has been used in the past but is somewhat dated. These terms reflect the notion that the researcher typically begins his or her analysis with a causal theory in mind pertaining to the relations among a set of variables. This theory implies a particular covariance structure among variables, and the researcher compares this implied covariance structure again against the pattern of covariances found in his or her data. Basically, the researcher is able to assess the degree of model fit by determining how similar the two covariance matrices are that is those that are implied by the one that is implied by the model and the one that is evident in the data set. So why carry out SEM? First, many traditional statistical techniques propose relationships between one or more independent variables and a single dependent variable, as in the case of ANOVA or a regression. In those cases where a researcher is interested in, in including two or more dependent variables, the researcher is often limited to procedures such as multivariate regression, MANOVA, and canonical correlation. And these basically provide tests of relationships between multiple independent and multiple dependent variables. Nevertheless, these techniques do not really allow you to unpack the relationships among the dependent variables on the dependent side of the model. SEM provides a mechanism for testing more complex multivariate relationships among variables and allows for testing predictive relationships among the dependent variables themselves. The dependent variables uh, in SEM are generally referred to as endogenous variables. Because of one above, SEM provides a more flexible way of testing for mediated effects of an independent variable on a dependent variable. Conventional statistical techniques such as ANOVA and regression assume that the variables included in those analyses are measured without error, which is often an untenable assumption. Unfortunately, measurement error associated with one's variables can attenuate the relationships observed in the data and or lead to biased parameter estimates. So SEM provides a flexible system that can allow a researcher to build in or adjust parameter estimates within a model to decrease um, attenuation and possible biases in parameter estimates. When I say build in, I should have said build in uh, measurement error or adjust parameter estimates within a model to decrease attenuation. SEM provides a mechanism through confirmatory factor analysis for te testing proposed causal structures. And then number five, SEM is flexible enough to provide mechanisms to, for comparing models across groups, modeling growth curves, and so forth. The notation in SEM um, follows a conventional drawing scheme. Uh, first of all, rectangles or squares are utilized to denote measured or observed or manifest variables. So measured, observed, and manifest um, are all basically treated as synonymous. Uh, basically, these are variables that are directly observed in the data. Um, um, ovals or circles are basically uh, denoting implicit or latent or unobserved variables. So these are not directly measured um, in the data. Um, generally they are um, indicated by measured variables. Um, a single-headed arrow reflects uh, a proposed causal association from one variable to another. So if I have X right here and Y right here, the pointer is pointing at Y, that means that I'm proposing that X causes variation in Y. If Y was here and X was here, then I'd be proposing that, um, that uh, Y was uh, causing um, variation in X. A double-headed arrow is basically reflecting a covariance or correlation between two variables. It's often, uh, it's also referred to as an unanalyzed association because we're not specifying a causal relationship, only that there's a covariation between uh, variables. 
Now let's look at some terminology. First, observed, measured, or manifest variable is one that is directly measured and for which data has been acquired in a study. A latent variable is one that is not directly measured in the study. They generally are indirectly measured by way of the observed variables. An exogenous variable is a variable that has no proposed cause in a model. Rather, it is postulated as a cause of variation in other variables in the model. So this is very analogous to the notion of an independent variable. An endogenous variable is a variable whose variation is proposed to be an outcome of other variables in the model. This variable may or may not be treated as a proposed cause of variation in other variables. For this reason, these variables can serve as both independent and dependent variables within the model. And then an unanalyzed association is a proposed relationship between two variables without any assumption of a causal relation between them. Um, in the context of uh, path analyses, um, you'll see terms such as direct effect and indirect effect and mediator. A direct effect refers to the proposed direct effect of X on Y. Again, using conventional notion, this is indicated by a single-headed arrow, X leads to Y. A mediator or a mediating variable is a variable that is proposed to explain the relationship between two other variables, um, where the causal flow runs from uh, X to Y to Z. So basically, variation in Y is a function of X, and variation in Z is a function of Y. So essentially, Y is sort of a go-between X and Z. And an indirect effect refers to the effect of X on Z by way of Y. So basically, the indirect effect is a product of paths A and B. Uh, other terms you'll come into contact with, goodness of fit and goodness of fit statistics. Goodness of fit refers to the judgment of the degree to which a proposed theoretical model fits one's data. In the context of SEM, it captures the degree to which the covariance structure implied by one's theoretical model fits with the observed covariance structure in one's data. Uh, and then we assess this by way of goodness of fit statistics. So this allows us to evaluate the overall fit of a theoretical model. Um, now, some examples of SEM models. Um, basically, regression analysis can be thought of as a fairly simple form of structural equation modeling. The re researcher proposes a theoretical model of causation among a set of variables and evaluates its fit to the data. Goodness of fit of the model is evaluated in terms of tests of R-square and the individual regression parameters. So as in a standard multiple regression model here, we've got achievement as the dependent variable or criterion variable being regressed onto self-efficacy, mastery goals, and performance goals. You can see that all of these variables are measured variables. That is that they are directly measured uh, and there's data on these variables in the data set. You can see that the paths are running uh, from each of these variables to uh, the dependent variable. In SEM uh, terminology, these would be the exogenous variables because there's nothing predicting variation in these. This would be an endogenous variable because this is the outcome of variation in these other variables. Um, the double-headed arrows are reflecting uh, covariances uh, or unanalyzed associations among the predictors or the exogenous variables. And you can see right here, this is an error term. This is basically the residuals for achievement. So this would be prediction error in achievement that is uh, reflecting variation in achievement that's unexplained by these variables here. This is an example of the Amos interface, or a picture of the Amos interface, just to show you, uh, uh, you know, what I was looking at when I was actually drawing up this particular model. Now, path analysis in involves modeling proposed direct and or indirect relationships among measured or latent variables in a model. Here, we have an example using only measured variables. Again, we have rectangles for each of these. Uh, whereas self-efficacy mastery goals and performance goals are exogenous variables predicting engagement. Engagement is an endogenous variable, but engagement is also predicting achievement. So any basically any variable that has um, residual um, term associated with it would be considered an endogenous variable because there's an arrow that leads to that particular variable. So engagement is... Um, is an endogenous variable and achievements an endogenous variable, but engagement is also serving as a mediator of the effects of these variables on achievement. These single-headed arrows all reflect direct effects, and if we take this path and multiply it by this path, that would be the indirect effect on achievement by self-efficacy. 
This path multiplied by this path would be the indirect effect of mastery goals on achievement. This path multiplied by this path would be the indirect effect of performance goals on achievement. So again, the double-headed arrows are uh, reflecting unanalyzed associations or covariances among the exogenous variables. In other SEM programs such as LISRL, uh, these are um, presented by default um, in, in the model. So these are estimated by default. Uh, in uh, Amos, you actually have to draw these in um, if you want to assume that these variables are correlated. And generally speaking, it's a good idea to correlate the exogenous um, predictor variables. It's, it's, it's fairly untenable to assume that there are no relationships uh, among your exogenous variables unless there's a good theoretical or empirical rationale otherwise. Here's an example of what's called a partial mediation model where the effect of the exogenous predictors on achievement runs through engagement. So we have self-efficacy mastery and performance goals running through engagement to achievement. Uh, but you also have a direct effect of performance goals on achievement. So, so the, the effects of performance goals on achievement are proposed to be both direct and also indirect through this route right here as we go from this path to uh, this path. This is an example of a confirmatory factor analysis um, in the Amos program. Uh, here we have three factors that are postulated. Um, you can see that we have arrows running from each factor to uh, these boxes right here. And so the boxes are measured variables. Um, for instance, if th these were items in a, in a uh, multifactorial survey, um, you have item 1, item 2, item 5, item 9, and so forth. And we also have essentially these are serving as indicators of these latent variables right here. So that's what I was saying a few slides ago about the latent variables are not directly measured, but rather they are indicated by measured variables. So in this particular case, we have a factor structure that's postulated with these items serving as indicators of self-efficacy, these items serving as indicators of mastery goals, and these items serving as indicators of performance goals. The E the little circles right here, as you can see, you've got these are basically referring to uh, measurement error. Okay, so you'll notice back here we had these R's right here. Sometimes they're uh, uh, listed as D1, D2, or, and so forth. These are referred to as residuals or disturbance terms. And so basically, um, measurement, uh, prediction error, or in this case, measurement error, are basically denoted as circles with an arrow pointing to a variable. And basically, um, it is treated as a latent variable because uh, it's it's not directly measured, but it's es you know in this particular case it's estimated after uh, looking to see what the, the the variation in engagement is accounted for by the predictors. Basically, this is what's left over. The same goes for achievement. So the same general notion applies here, where we're basically uh, uh, these errors, the measurement errors, are basically referred to as uh, uniquenesses. And uh, basically, it's variation in these items that's not accounted for by the proposed factors. So, um, met, so the uniquenesses are basically a combination of random measurement error plus specific variation that's unrelated to uh, the proposed factors. This is an example of another CFA model. Basically, it's just an elaboration where I have actually correlated errors and. In, su in certain circumstances, it might be wise to do that. For instance, if there are method effects uh, associated with these items, for instance, let's say items 2, item 9, and item 7 were all reverse coded items, whereas all the other items are positively worded. So the reverse coding might introduce a method artifact that may help to explain some of the variation and ultimately the covariation uh, in, in some of our variables. So I can um, capture uh, that method artifact by, poten by potentially by um, correlating the uh, measurement errors. This is an example of a path analysis using latent variables. So it incorporates a measurement model um, which we could have extended this further and used all our variables as uh, self-efficacy mastery goals, uh, performance goals, engagement, and achievement. Um, 
So there's a CFA model uh, involved, and that oftentimes that's the first step when working with path analysis let, with latent variables. Is basically generating what's called a measurement model through the use of, of confirmatory factor analysis, determining how well the, the indicators uh, measure their respective latent constructs, and then we can uh, specify proposed causal associations among the latent variables themselves. So you can see that this is basically, these are the paths that are proposed in the model, and these are basically reflecting um, uh, the causal uh, theory um, used to generate them. Okay, this is another example of um, a model that we could run theoretically. This is basically like a regression model. Uh, let's say, for instance, I am looking at the effect of a treatment, um, you know, be, uh, you know, where um, individuals are either in a treatment or a control group, and I want to look to see after a treatment period what the effect is on a, on post test scores. Uh, this is sort of analogous to a ANCOVA using latent variables. So in this particular case, I've got post test scores that are being indicated by items on that post test. Um, so this is basically a post post-test post factor, if you will. Um, and so these are the uniquenesses associated with the measurements for uh, the at post-test. And then I've also got pre-test scores included, and so these are um, the indicators at pre-test. So these would be time one and then time two right here, and uh, uniquenesses associated with measurement at pre-test. I've also included a covariance right here, which probably wouldn't make sense unless um, I have a situation such as a quasi-experimental design. If I was, this was a true experimental design, uh, this probably would be less necessary. But at any rate, uh, this would be uh, analogous to a regression analysis uh, where a, a treatment is a dummy-coded grouping variable uh, uh, being used to predict uh, an outcome variable, uh, and a covariate being the pretest scores uh, also as a predictor of, of post-test post scores. This is an example of a latent growth curve analysis. Um, so basically, uh, latent growth curve analysis can be used to model in, inner um, individual change on a variable over time. So in this example, we're modeling change in math knowledge, measured, which is a measured variable at time one, time two, and time three. Uh, the intercept itself is modeling inner individual differences in time one math knowledge, so between person differences in math knowledge, whereas the slope um, factor is uh, modeling inner individual differences in the rate of change over time. So basically different individuals may um, uh, exhibit different growth rates and so this particular model right here uh, would allow us to do that. This is just sort of an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, if we think about each of these um, lines right here as reflecting uh, an individual's growth trajectory at time one, that would be essentially the intercept for each person. Uh, and then the slope of the line is reflecting uh, the rate of change over time from time one to time two to time three. So you can see that uh, beginning math knowledge scores um, are varying uh, for the individuals and that's what the uh, intercept is essentially tapping is that between person differences in uh, the intercepts and then the slope uh, the slope factor right here is reflecting the notion that each person has a different rate of change so you can see that those people in this case who started out lower in math knowledge tended to exhibit greater rates of change over time than those people who scored higher in math knowledge the basically the slopes are a little bit flatter um, if we wanted to go a little bit further, we could also add in predictor variables, predictors of um, um, the uh, intercept and, the, and slope parameters for each person. So in other words, we might be interested in determining whether or not males and females differed in their, uh, starting, uh, in their starting points. So for instance, it could be that uh, these individuals down here are the females and these individuals right here are the males. Um, and what that would also mean, though, is that the females are exhibiting a greater ro rate of change um, uh, over time than the, uh, than the males do. Um, so at any rate, we can model um, uh, growth rates and then predictors of growth rates by adding in additional predictors. So these were just a few examples of what I'm talking about with different types of SEM models. Uh, this PowerPoint was generated using the Amos um, drawing program and um, 
so hopefully uh, this will serve as a good introduction to um, this uh, area of um, statistical analysis.